I'm not this black guy who's calling people out um, because of their racial um, issues. I am an African American of European, um, African, Middle Eastern, and Native American descent who is saying we are family. We are in this together because we have bloodlines that are crossed. Hi, I'm Helen Holliman. I'm joined today by Michael Twitty, a culinary historian and food writer. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. So, you know, let's just jump right into it. You know, you started something really interesting called the Cooking Gene Project. And part of that is something called the Southern Discomfort Tour. Yeah. Can you kind of give me like a run through of what it is and like what is the Southern Discomfort Tour? Well, I thought the Southern Discomfort Tour was going to be a one-shot deal. Uh, the reality is, is that when you work for your ancestors, it's on their time and it's a lifetime journey. So two things. I called it the cooking gene because um, I felt like there was something innate and something uh, ancestral about the cooking process. Um, particularly my interest in cooking and food and where it comes from and where our ancestors came from and the whole story. Um, when you grow up African American, you grow up with the sense that you are not ethnic, you're just racial. And the problem with that is that racial doesn't carry with it any of the undertones of heritage, of location, of identity. It just, it's just what you see in the mirror. And so for me, I had to locate the project in a way that says, this is me exploring that background as an ethnic person, a person of African descent of mixed heritage. But also, the next level was calling this a Southern Discomfort Tour because I felt like, well, we kind of came up with a name to reflect the idea that this is not a comfortable conversation. Talking about slavery, talking about issues of race, ethnicity, identity, um, not just the past, but the present and the future. And so going to places that are central to um, slavery and cultural memory and cooking in those places and having dialogues in those places around food and around people preparing the food that get us into other territories, I felt was you know, a way we could just play on words and say, if you think we're going there to you know, sing Song of the South, we're not. We're going there because we want to confront um, this history and this reality. So, I mean, describe what you're doing, you know, where you're going, because you're heading to plantations. Right. How are you cooking there? What takes place? And who is showing up to eat with you? I think people need to understand, first of all, that when you go to places beneath the Mason-Dixon line through to Texas, Oklahoma, <clears throat> you're going to encounter um, museums and houses that were owned in colonial antebellum times. These places are toured, they are big business, they are not sort of like hidden away. No, they're, they're the first thing you see when you pick up any brochure, the first thing you see when you walk into the, the, um, the rest area where they have like the, the books and the guides. This is f front and center. To most people outside of the South, that would be anathema. You're advertising places of slavery and slavery, but, there's not, but that's not what they're doing. They're advertising the aristocracy that once was and the lost cause and the pre-Civil War glory, which almost never includes us. So those sites that are willing to sort of um, let me and others come in and interpret slavery, they're making a leap of faith on their own because for many of these places, they never talked about it, or we were the servants, or we were, you know, so-and-so's people. Those are the words, that they, the kind of like circumlocution words they use. So I go in, I look, say, well, do we have a kitchen here? They'll have a kitchen or they'll have outside space where I can cook. And so I'm cooking outside or I'm cooking at a historic kitchen, and it's a very strange feeling. You put the clothes on, and all of a sudden, you're in that world, you're in that mindset. And don't forget, at each one of these sites, there are hundreds of graves of enslaved people that are just buried and forgotten. So I walk into that space, I pour a libation, it's the first thing I do. Um, and I pour a little water, a little alcohol out, and you know, I ask permission of God and the ancestors to let me interpret at that site. And then I start cooking. You know, from the minute I put the fire on, 
you know, um, I got to tell you, I feel very metaphysical, very supernatural about the whole experience. And then who comes in to see these things? Um, mo mainly white visitors. A lot of them are local or in the local community. Um, they tend to be older, but they're also to be, you know, school kids, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, etc. I tend to have an easy time with the kids, not so much of an easy time with the adults. Um, sometimes they say things or do things which are insensitive, but I don't think they know they're insensitive. Or they'll talk in ways that almost seem like they're on, <laughs> you know, pre-civil rights racial autopilot. And it's hard to hold your tongue. One lady at one site said to me, she was a docent, and she, we had some kind of Christmas plantation thing where I was cooking all day, and I was supposed to just, you know, explain what I was making and talk a little about the history. And the woman said to me, now look, okay, there you go. You don't have to tell them about the history and all that. Just tell them that you're the cook and be done with it. And I, I, I was like, hold up, you better go back in the big house where you still get a chance because this is not 18 something, this is 2000 whatever it was and I don't have to take that. But those kinds of interactions are frequent. Um, now for all, every one of those, there are 10 moments where you feel like people get it and you feel like people really are trying to understand. So you cook this meal and mm -hmm. you serve it. Beyond that, you know, are there any, do you try to kind of open up the conversation at all or do you just allow them to experience it? Like how does that sort of transpire? Absolutely. I, one thing I do is if there are kids around in particular, I love it when there are kids of different backgrounds around. I'll make them do little chores in the kitchen. Even if they're only standing there for five minutes, I put them to work because I want the kids to understand that nothing was microwaved. <laughs> Everything had a process, and I want kids of different backgrounds to work together. For um, adults, I sometimes do the same kind of work. I don't like a kitchen where I'm the only person cooking or doing anything, because I didn't grow up that way. I learned how to cook by working alongside my mother, grandmother, father, and uncles. And so you always had something to do. It didn't matter what it was, some little chore. And by doing that, the dialogue starts. It's a way to get people to talk. And then all of a sudden they'll say, I remember, and you got them. And then that's an a inroads. And all of a sudden other people will come and say, yeah, I remember that too. And it's, it's something to see, you know, let's say, for example, a 70-year-old black person, a 70-year-old white person from the same part of the South who have never really talked or met, who may have some of the same family names between each other, have that moment of connection, and you are the connector. And then you step back and you let that dialogue continue. And that's happened more often than not. And so at that moment, we sort of get that sort of, you know, window into the opportunity to have the kind of um, interaction that we would hope these events would bring out. So it's not just about where I come from, it's where we all sort of come from. So, you know, I mean, cooking, back in the antebellum south, I mean, talk about like really complicated and mm -hmm. there's no grocery store, there's no, no microwave. How do you deal with the research, gathering, and actually building all of the kitchen techniques to be oh, able to wow. a meal? So how do we do this process? So this is where it starts. First of all, I have to know where I'm, where I'm working with. There are many souths. There's not just one south. So the environment, the ecosystems, um, foraging, I always forage when I cook. Um, I made it a priority to sort of learn as much as I could about um, common sort of foraged plants so I don't kill anybody. Um, but also, so it's an opportunity. So if there are kids around, I like taking them out and saying, okay, this is a moral mushroom, or this is this, this is persimmon, or this is this kind of fruit. And so they say, oh, wow, and they make them eat the thing, and that's an experience. Um, but also, I like to see if there are any elders who are able to make that trip with me. And the learning from them is always like a, a thing. You can't run out to the store, you know, and get whatever you want, because the taste will not be approximate. And I want to emphasize that. It's always approximate. It's never the same as it was. We'll never know. 
exactly how certain things, we can only approximate what we think. And certain people in today's world may wonder why is it important? Uh, why do you care? What is that, what is, what good does that do us to sort of have that discussion and really go to those lens? Um, first things first, knowing what grew in the past was part of our agricultural, our natural um, heritage is really a first step in being grateful and appreciative of what we have and taking care of it. You know, there are certain varieties of heirloom apples that will help us survive global warming because they can survive warmer, hotter climates. There, there, there are practical reasons to all of this. You don't really throw away your past because your past may come to save you in your future. And so that's a big thing for me. A lot of the attitudes people have about how people lived in the past, those are the changes out of me as well because I just thought, oh, you just shoot a gun. But wait a minute, you're an enslaved person. You can't have a gun in your possession because it is against the law. Just like you can't have a book. You know, so rethinking the whole process of how to cook. If I can't read a recipe and I can't shoot a gun and I have no access to fresh milk, fresh eggs, salt, lard, cooking oils, butter, um, black pepper, all these common things people cook with white bread, um, the basics of sort of like cooking in the past, how am I actually cooking? So I had to research all of that and I read through all of the WPA narratives. And WPA narratives um, were part of the Works Products Administration during the Depression. And they were collected by interviewers who went across the South interviewing upwards of 3,000 plus formerly enslaved individuals. Most of whom would have been children, um, but many of whom were teenagers or young adults, up to 25, 35 at the most during the period of uh, the last years of slavery. And from their interviews, we know an incredible lot of information about what enslaved people ate, how they hunted, how they fished, how they gathered. But you couple that with archaeology, and you couple that with plantal and animal or fallen remains that you find all over the South. You talk to your elders, because remember, oral tradition and oral tradition, both spoken and heard, is the crux of how we pass on knowledge in our community. So you add that, you add on memories, and you add on you know, folk histories, and all of a sudden you go from having very little to having an immense body of knowledge. What's the most challenging thing that you've ever had to prepare? Mm -hmm. Whether it was just like building a fire and making something, or you know, what, at what point did you kind of look at the culinary perspective of history and this experience and say, wow, that was super involved? Actually, the worst thing ever is to have to start a fire with the flint, striking a flint. That takes forever. Um, it's a skill that I still haven't mastered. Um, so you can imagine that fire is what you depend on for everything. You have to get it started. And time is money during slavery. You know, you are not allowed to mess up. You are not allowed to go slow. You are not allowed to um, mess up my time, you know most of the time with the elites that own you. And just thinking about that process alone just made me feel like, wow, this is kind of funny, this is kind of cute that I've taken three hours to start this fire. But if I was an enslaved person, I'd be beaten by now. And I would learn how to do that just because of brute force. And so that really started to change my mind, give me a sort of a little bit of more seriousness toward what I do. But just the, you know, the idea of like butchering hogs and Solving them, smoking them, putting up the meat, and the whole, just everything, canning and preserving, all of those things have just sort of like taught me a serious appreciation for um, not just people who did them in the past, people who do them today, and try to teach others. Because I think in one guise, we're running out of time as a society. We don't really have a lot of time to do anything for ourselves or for our families or for our friends. But on the other hand, those activities were meant to bring people together. And once I realized that, too, I said, well, this is not for me to do alone. This is for me to do in community. So you lead some classes kind of um, helping people to kind of trace their roots back to mm -hmm. Africa, right. no matter where they land on that genealogical spectrum. Right. And how does that work? I mean, beyond DNA testing, when you employ 
scholarly tactics and everything else, like how do you get people to kind of learn about this and what do they expect in the class? I think, I think that a lot of people, unfortunately, have received a really substandard education regarding um, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, for example, um, one ethnic group might have 10 different ethnonyms. It's like me saying to you, English, British, Anglo-Saxon, the word picture in your head is United Kingdom, that area of the world. But that's because you've always learned that your entire life. But what if I change that to Fulani, Fulbe, Pur, Pur, Fula? All of a sudden you're like, huh, what? So you have to actually teach people that, oh yeah, that's the same ethnic group. It just depends on which European uh, country colonized them and what they chose to call them and what they're called in different dialects based on where they're spread across the continent. So making that leap to going back to the continent is very difficult for most people because they don't have the background information. Uh, there, was, there was no Ghana, you know, 200 years ago. There was no Nigeria. These countries did not exist and the borders didn't exist. So it's really um, an act of reconnecting people with information and getting them to sort of remember that there are no easy answers and there are easy feelings. You know, you can't just skip on back to the continent. You have to take with you a lot of knowledge with you that's uncomfortable. You know, um, certain African ethnic groups were responsible for um, gaining power to bring other African ethnic groups into the transatlantic slave trade system. And so you have to make your peace with that. Or you need to make your peace with the fact that you were, your bloodlines include all of those people and the above. You know, it includes oppressors and the oppressed. And I think for, you know, if you grew up in your European America and you grew up with this idea that you're a smattering of this, smattering of that, but you're just white, there's a certain privilege in that. But when you're African American, you begin this journey, you really have to sort of tease out all of the different parts. Um, I'll give you an example. I am above 25% European ancestry. That puts me in a very strange club because the vast majority of African Americans are um, maybe 15 to 20% or less European, you know, through slave owners having um, either illicit or um, coerced relationships with their enslaved women in particular. You come from one ethnic group that enslaved another one that you belong to. That's a very deep thing because you're trying to unravel these layers of sort of like narrative and identity and being proud of who you are and yet you have to really unlink those chains as it were. And so that's another part of the work is really getting people to sort of emotionally come to terms with the, the levels and the layers of and complexity of where they come from. You've been known to say that terroir is in your genes. Yeah. And, you know, it's sort of like there's that phrase, you are what you eat. And, right. you know, today in like the modern world, how do you think that where we come from plays into that philosophy? The first thing you have to keep in mind is where you come from, where you're located, where you physically are, where you call, what you call your neighborhood, what you call your home, your home city, your home, you know, whatever it is, rural, suburban, wherever you are, all those play into your sense of food place, okay? So right now we're in an area where a bodega might be part of your food place. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, but also you have to think about what kinds of foods are good for me, what kinds of foods are um, emblematic of my heritage. Um, I also believe that your plate is your flag. You know, everybody has your own unique flag. If you grow from Pacific Northwest and you have Asian fusion and local stuff and your ethnic heritage all together, that's your flag, you know, that's what I believe. Um, just like you can be from Harlem and be, you know, part soul food, part takeout Chinese, part Samuelson's experiment, whatever it is, that's who you are. 
I really hope that people take the time to make the space around them, speak to where they come from, who they are, and where they're going, and then put that back on the plate. Once you understand that that environment that you've created in that circle, or that square, whatever you have in front of you, is sit down to a meal, is an extension of you, an extension of the community that you want to build, and the family that you hope to be, then you can then approach food from a very different perspective. It stops being an idol, it stops being um, a desired item, and it starts being a means to foment your own humanity. You're Jewish, and you know how does that play into your diet and what you're doing in all of your work? In modern Judaism, in American Judaism, we really sort of have a bent towards social justice. Um, that is part of our tradition. You know, justice, justice shalt thou pursue. That's the part of the Hebrew Bible tradition that we emphasize. And not just that, but African-American um, tradition draws heavily on sort of the same ethics. That was the ground um, work behind the civil rights movement, right? You know, that this we are divinely mandated to pursue what's right, what's good for all of us. Um, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that I do have sort of like a sub-identity called kosher soul. And that means that I cook kosher food, or excuse me, I cook African-American and Jewish foods mixed from across both diasporas in a kosher way for my own home and enjoyment. And I, uh, I often use the phrase that if you sit and eat my food, you'll understand me. Because a lot of people, when they first encounter that idea of me being African American and Jewish, the stereotypes start flying around, and I'm like, no, you need to put that away. You know, don't, un don't unpack those ideas around me because they're insulting. But if you eat the food, you'll understand. We're talking about a dialogue of diasporas, a dialogue not only about oppression, but about humor, having a sense of humor, being able to use what you have. Um, appreciating the seasons of the places where you are now exiled to. These are both cuisines of exile. And so all of those things put together, um, and it gives me access to an incredibly large world. You know, There were Jews in China, there were Jews in India, there were Jews in Ethiopia, Jews in Yemen, um, Jews who came very early to Brazil and other parts of Latin America. So essentially, you know, um, it's a global cuisine, just like African diaspora is about a global cuisine. There were African people in every corner of the world um, before 1800. And so it's really cool to be part of two groups um, who in some ways can tell the entire story of global cuisine through their heritage. Um, now some people ask me the question, well how do you do all this cooking hogs and all this stuff that's treif or not kosher and you're Jewish? And I often make the point that your faith and your culture can be very important to you, but you can make certain divisions. When I am Mr. Annabellum chef, I am respecting and reflecting traditions of my ancestors who were enslaved. When I'm kosher soul, I'm kosher soul, and the two never mix. So you wrote an open letter to Paula Dean uh, shortly after, you know, she had her whole controversy yeah. using the N word, um, a whole court case. And uh, in it, you invite her to dinner to right. come have a meal at a plantation. Right. And uh, first of all, I want to know, did she show up? No. And <laughs> has she responded? No. And what are your thoughts since then? Well, I think that we haven't learned our lesson. That's the first thing. Um, we just went through several rounds of Spitfire flashpoints. Um, Duck Dynasty, the Annie DeFranco controversy, Madonna, where certain words are bandied about, used, um, where we continually support um, franchises, people, and others who just don't get it. And we say, ah, eh, mea culpa, and it's all over. And um, I recently came to the conclusion that apologies are woefully inadequate. 
I think it's better to have someone explain, what exactly do you mean by that? Where are you coming from? Where are you located that that is how you feel? Um, my mother used to do that to me. It was a good way to get me to think about how I used my tongue, how I used my lips, how I used my teeth, and how God created all those as borders for so you to not say the wrong thing. You know, it wasn't, no, 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 just tell me I'm sorry. What exactly did you mean by that? You know, that's a good black mama trick. And, you know, break it down for me. Because if, if you feel a certain way, bring it. Let's get it all out in the open. But we can, we've continued to um, make media darlings of people for whom there is no sort of um, redemption in regards to this issue. I feel very mixed feelings regarding uh, Ms. Paula because on the one hand, I feel that she was very much a perfect scapegoat. An overweight woman, you know, um, past her childbearing years, who, you know, built her business without a man. Perfect, 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 perfect. Um, and you see people sort of like either giving her, you know, leeway or really coming down on her. And I think it's a mixed bag. I would be disappointed not to hear from her. Even in, even in sort of a quiet, off-camera way, I would have appreciated that um, if she knew that about this letter at all. I hope she did. I think she may have, but I don't really. I can't say she did or didn't. But the bottom line for me was um, I didn't see her as a combatant. I saw her as someone who could actually have a lot of good to say if given the chance and not be redeemed for thinking or saying certain words. I think I, I, I've always said that, you know, uh, there are some people for whom they, they have a certain worldview they were raised with, born into, that will always be a part of them. Okay, fine. But the idea that Southern food is just greasy, unhealthy comfort food, the idea that, you know, um, people of color are sidelines or in the background, um, you know, as opposed to being the creators or co-creators of this tradition. Um, the idea that, you know, those same cooks have to struggle and um, work twice, ten times as hard to keep their restaurants going and their franchises going while this is a multi-million dollar empire based on a caricature mm -hmm. of Southern food. Really, that was so much more important to me. But I don't think we've learned a lesson yet. I really don't. And I hope that it doesn't take another flashpoint to get us to learn our lesson. You know, in Europe and, and in the U.S., there are Holocaust museums. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have school programs where we learn about the Holocaust. And we also learn about slavery. But, you know, do you feel like American culture has really been able to address it and talk about it um, contemporary? Or <laughs> if not? Mm. How can people try to talk about it? Well, I think, I think it runs, I think this particular past couple of months, 12 Years a Slave um, made a slow burn dent, you know. Um, there are other examples. There are books, more books came out about the subject. American Horror Story focused part of their story on slavery and race and all that kind of stuff. A lot of, there's a lot of pop media discussions about this. And all that's well and good. And not just pop stuff, but just serious serious art about it as well. But I'll tell you something. I was in a plantation in South Carolina and I was cooking. And the kitchen was kind of, 12 people were there. Um, three of which were German. It was a ger German gentleman. He was in his 70s. So obviously he had been born during World War II. At that time period, grew up in that time period. And he was translating for his wife and brother. And he looked at us, us several African-American interpreters, in our clothes cooking, and he said, how do you feel dressed like that and working in a place like this? Are you comfortable? Are you, are you, how does it feel to do that? And I said to him, you know, America has not really come to terms with the full legacy of slavery, positive and negative. And he said to me, and I said to him, I said, well, unlike Germany, for whom, you know, you guys have really had to deal with the Shoah, and I use the Hebrew term, 
and he knew what I was talking about, and he said, quick as a flash, the Holocaust was a terrible thing and never should have happened. And as soon as he said that, he said, America needs to deal with slavery in the same way. The room cleared out of white Southerners. All of them were older, couldn't take it. They, didn't, they weren't there for that. They were there for us to, to, to be happy and cook and create wonderful smells in the kitchen and you know, make delicacies and comfort food. But when he said that, that cleared the room. They didn't like that at all. And I'm not indicting white Southerners, I'm just saying that particular group of people in that room, who all of whom were older, probably about the same age as him, but were fed a completely different messages about power, about race, about identity, about truth. Um, I try to tell people all the time that um, King Cotton had a cuisine too. And it was a cuisine that was kind of deadly because it was a cuisine based on um, certain kinds of carbohydrates and fats and other things that weren't good for us. Um, it was a culture where education for black people was illegal, where the black family was not respected, where you could, you could almost never find husband, wife, son, daughter families because they were constantly being broken up. And I ask people to look at that experience and go, okay, excuse me, all of these sort of pathologies that you kind of call out in black life go back to this moment when this country had felt that making money off of this one crop, which became two thirds of its export value, was more important than human dignity for generations to come. And you wonder why we're in the space that we are now. Um, if people understood how slavery worked, if they understood how the, the toll that it took, if they understood how much infrastructure this country was built on slavery. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I've often had people come up to me during presentations and say, my ancestors never owned enslaved people. What do I have to, my people came here after a certain date. And I said, well, the road was paved for you. And what do you mean? Oh, by the way, those mills that you worked in up north, those cotton and textile mills, where do you think the cotton came from? Okay? Um, and I tell them, did you know that there were more people of African descent that crossed the ocean before 1800 than Europeans? What does that mean? Why is that? You know, I am not, I'm not this black guy who's calling people out um, because of their racial um, issues. I am an African American of European, um, African, Middle Eastern, and Native American descent who is saying we are family. We are in this together because we have bloodlines that are crossed. We are connected to each other. So you need to understand where I'm coming from and you understand where you're coming from and we need to meet at the table. We need to eat, meet and, eat and meet at the table and really come to context um, in terms of what we need to do next with each other because we cannot survive as a species or as a nation if we refuse to have that conversation. So it's not an easy one to have, um, but it is one that's necessary. And um, as long as we refuse to come to some collective state of memory about slavery and its aftermath, then we will never have that conversation. And uh, what is the, um, I mean, are you, do you have any books on the horizon or any projects beyond this that you're working on? Well, The Cooking Gene is going to be a book project. It's, it's in the works right now. And, you know, um, ever since that I found out my, part of my African ancestry, um, it's really been exciting, sort of like, you know, through words, take those first footsteps back to the continent. I'm calling this a culinary version of roots. Because, you know, food is a way in which we can talk about these issues where some of the, some of the hurts, some of the pains, some of the um, offbeat humor is sort of tempered by the fact that everybody has to eat. Most people like to eat and most people enjoy talking about food. And so by using food as a way to trace my family roots and sort of express where I come from and who I'm connected to and why, I hope that that project leads to you know, a greater dialogue about how, how we eat and what we eat makes who we are and how who we are in, in reflexive 
in a reflexive state influences the other side of it too. So um, we'll see, we will see. Um, my dream the next year is to go to Sierra Leone and go to uh, Mende Land, where my maternal roots go back to, and go back to Ghana. Uh, Ghana is full of the, the um, places where ancestors saw the door of no return. And so I really feel like um, once I'm able to make that journey to Ghana, Sierra Leone, to Senegal, to other places, that I feel like I've truly come full circle and come home. So, you know, you've talked a lot about the idea that being African American is not an ethnicity. Um, how do you think that, you know, in the future we can try to articulate that and learn about the past and incorporate it into current, you know, cooking culture, our culture, our histories, embrace the past and bring that into the folds to change the future and to change right. the way that we think about the past. So the reason why I use the term African American is not because it was bequeathed to me. It's because the earliest um, black folks in federal America, right after the Constitution, everything, every organization they had was called African or Ethiopian. Okay. These are the grandchildren of people who came over on a boat. So their identity was not black or colored or Negro. Their identity was, yeah, we ultimately go back to this place called Africa, this continent, and um, that's who we are. So, unfortunately, people hear African American, they hear race. I think it's important people understand that at one point in time, African Americans had a very clear, had very clear um, lingua franca as they used among themselves. It's unfortunate people think of our way of talking as, as slang. Ebonics or AEV, which is African American vernacular English, is just slang. At one point, it was an actual separate language, in the same way the Jamaican patois or other forms of black language in the New World were separate. Um, domestic slave trade and other forms of breaking up our community life actually went a long way to sort of destroying some of the canons of what you think of as being ethnic. Um, clothing, language, if you look at you know, modern Latino communities, what makes you Latino? You eat certain foods when there's you know, a program or a, or a celebration, you dress a certain way, you have a, a language that makes you distinct. We had all of those things, but it was beaten out of us. And so in the reclamation of that, I think a lot of times we were, we were called out for being inauthentic or sort of, you know, invalid. And so we had to constantly fight against that too. And so I think people need to understand that, you know, as an ethnic group, we are both what we come from historically, what we have reclaimed, what we, what we want to reclaim. I, I don't think it's anybody else's place to say that, you know, our community life is valid or invalid. When I was growing up, my mom taught me how to count the ten in Swahili. Okay? Swahili was the language, was the black language of black power. Nothing wrong with that. Because what it did for me was it taught me respect for at least one part of this humongous universe of African culture. When you see yourself as a people who came over on a boat, who had a language, who had a culture, and you see yourself as, as, as being responsible for reclaiming that and owning that legacy, that's when you move from being a race to an ethnic group, and when that can be privately so. And how do you bring that in on the plate? So you kind of look at the food itself. I mean, black-eyed peas are almost 4,000 years old as a food. I mean, that's, you know, about <laughs> as old as you can get in terms of just humanity constantly doing something. So every time you put black-eyed peas in your plate, or leafy greens in a plate, um, you are enacting a food tradition that goes back, you know, before, you know, I don't know, before the Roman period, before um, steel, 
before so many things that we have in human history that were marks, markers of our progress. Every time I incorporate these certain foods into how I eat, the spices, the vegetables, the, the plants and the animals that come from the continent of Africa, realizing that 70,000 years ago, the first major branch of the human race was to West Africa, and then I carry those genes in my body. That, to me, is an awesome experience because I am now on this sort of scientific level looking at myself going, wow, I am reenacting a human tradition through food, through foods, plural, whether it's rice, whether it's melons, whether it's okra, um, that has been nonstop. That you know that these things go back so far into human history, science can't put a date on it. That is a feeling of real deep connection, and it makes the plate less of, you know, essential experience and more of an education. Yeah. Well, Michael Twitty, thanks so much for coming Thank on. Thank you so much, Megan. <laughs>